welcome to my talk on ESAPI. Um, I will advise you that this is an extended uh, version of the talk that I gave at the 20th anniversary presentation back in September. So if you already have been to that and there was another talk you were interested in, you might want to slide sideways to one of those other talks. I'm not trying to discourage you from listening, but you know, just fair warning. Um, all right, so first thing, before anyone gets the urge to take copious notes, I want to let you know that I'm going to, you know, just take a screenshot of this and basically give you all the important stuff to remember. Um, and then sit back and relax with your favorite beverage because um, I'm going to upload the slides on my GitHub. And um, uh, let's see. Um, also, uh, I am going to, you know, uh, Charles mentioned Whova in the Q&A section. I will promise that I will write answers to any ones that I do not have time to reply to during this presentation. So, um, or you can also contact me at, at the email listed here or DM me on uh, OS Slack or on, or on Twitter. Um, one of the, so first of all, basically, you know, you're looking at this slide and you're like, well, duh, thank you, Captain Obvious, right? Um, let me say that I did development for, you know, or either exclusive development or a mix of development and, um, and AppSec for 30 years. And before I realized all the nuances that were involved here, especially in that first bullet item, right? And um, so I want, hopefully you'll bear with me and realize that there are some unique uh, challenges that maybe are not quite completely obvious to everyone, especially if most of your uh, development practices were doing product development. All right, so before I go into too much detail, you know, uh, I want to, you know, should you really listen to me about this? Um, well, I did say these are, you know, it, this is only my opinion, not anybody else in the OWASP Foundation, not anybody else uh, that's contributed to ESAPI, I'm going to make that clear, not, not my employers, current or former, right? But I have had, like Charles said in the introduction, 20 years of systems programming and 20 years of AppSec development, and including um, developing several proprietary systems libraries, including one that was very specific almost to AppSec, very, very similar actually uh, to ESAPI. And that's one of the reasons that I joined ESAPI in 2009. Um, and ESAPI dates back maybe about two years earlier, at least as far as I could tell, uh, you know, going back into the mailing list archives, right? And then I was like, um, volunteered to be the co-lead in 2011. And the other thing is, lastly, I promise that this is a buzzword free talk. Right. I'm not going to mention blockchain or AI or quantum computing, and I'm especially not going to promise. I'm especially going to promise not to discuss quantum AI blockchain technology, which I'm sure someone is, is claiming to develop. Um, I'm just mentioning these um, basically to help you fill in your buzzword bingo cards. All right. So the approach that I'm taking with this talk is that I'm going to discover that I'm going to discuss like three overall perspectives about process, about people, and the technical or architectural aspects of it. And then for each of those perspectives, it's going to have four sections, an overview like that basically briefly describes what that pers perspective is about, uh, and then the good, what went, what was done right, and the bad, what was done wrong. And then the ugly is kind of like neither really good or bad, but they were kind of ugly hacks that worked that probably could be improved at some point or at least they're not elegant things right all right so um from the process perspective of the overview um I skip yeah um so libraries and applications are different they're different in design right you don't design libraries the same way libraries are extensible applications generally are not uh testing is different as well right you might use like something like, uh, you know, the unit testing is a similar, but like you don't have like end user testing and stuff like that. Those aspects are completely different. Um, penetration testing, if you wanted to do it, would be different, 
right? You don't have anything to pen test necessarily, especially if you just have like interfaces. And I'm going to extensively talk on that. The documentation is different. It, it addresses a completely different audience instead of an end user. It's going to be uh, addressing a developer uh, of some sort, right? Um, the other thing is you have a much higher chance of client lock-in. When somebody invests, you know, to using your code and uses it all over their millions of lines of code, especially something like eSAPI where you got like, maybe you have JSPs, right? And you're using the output encoder um, all over the place to prevent cross-site scripting, right? And you got a couple thousand of those. It's really tough to like, say, if you want to change the interface, oh, we made a mistake. We got to switch the order of these arguments or do something, right? That's not going to not gonna fly well, right? Uh, security libraries versus other libraries, not eating our own dog food um, and processes of uh, effects of later, uh, effects of later process change. Those are the other things I wanted to mention. Um, so I'm gonna go into some of these others in detail. All right, so, so where was I? Uh, so yes, so things, the good thing is that things started out small. They had very simple expectations. Um, you know, they started basically as interfaces. And original vision, in fact, was basically only provide um, interfaces. Of course, the problem is how do you test an interface? Well, you have to have some kind of executable code at least to do, um, you know, unit testing. And you, you kind of have to play around with the interfaces in some way, right, to see are these the right interfaces to provide? and. Are we exposing the right things or do we need to provide other interfaces and things like that? So in order to do that, they created a reference model and that reference model um, got bundled with the uh, interfaces, which in hindsight was probably a poor idea, but you know, it happened. So um, the bad in the process. Well, um, I'm gonna talk about these individual bullets uh, later on right, in the next couple of slides here. So I won't belabor this one. But like the the release migration, did we have enough feedback to do the one dot uh, to, from one dot one, one dot, or actually one dot four, I think it was the latest one dot X release. Did we have enough feedback from users of that library? Um, I'm not sure that we actually left enough time between the release cycles. Um, but uh, one of the things is you can't use like libraries just out of the box. You need to write code to give a feedback. It's not like, so it's hard to like, you know, you do have, we did like release candidates, but I don't, you know, I think the number of people using the release candidates was really, really small. Um, uh, so the other thing is going from one, uh, release, you know, the one question that should have been asked is like, why even release uh, 2.x? Because one of the major reasons of you make a major jump in the semantic versioning is that you decide that these release, these previous interfaces are not correct and we want to deprecate them. And, you know, that's what basically a major change means on a major number, right? Um, so you can basically decide that we're going to change the interfaces, only we didn't, or at least not most of them. Right. And that included even the broken cryptography that I took over. Right. So we tried um, to keep the old uh, 1.4 encryptor interfaces and just add new ones that were correct on top of that. Although I did deprecate the old ones and put in clear warnings, these are not safe and don't use them. But, you know, they think, oh, people have legacy code and they have encrypted stuff. And um, so we got to keep them. So I'm like, okay. And, you know, uh, shocker, it's like uh, that actually was largely responsible for one of the two CVEs that were later discovered after, shortly after we released 2.0 release. So, um, so the other thing was this is what I meant when I said we we're ignoring um, or eating or not eating our own dog food, right? Uh, this could be perceived as kind of a do as I say, not as I do thing, right? But you know, we always typically as AppSec engineers, at least I do, I don't know, maybe the rest of you don't, but I'm like, I ask people like, well, what's your threat model? And what are you trying to, you know, prevent here? What, what are your 
uh, what's your attack vectors and things, right? Or, or state, <clears throat> well, are you doing, you know, regular security code reviews? Or, you know, you tell the testers uh, or you tell the developers that, you know, your unit tests should include more than just a sunny day path. And you should keep your dependencies up to date. And we didn't do a lot of those things, at least on a regular, consistent basis. I mean, we are much better now, uh, you know, uh, in the last couple of years. Um, we added like roughly like a thousand unit tests and stuff to, to bring the coverage up significantly. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and in fact, the first unit test wasn't until, I mean, the first code review wasn't until um, NSA did the code review for us. And I will speak more to that later. All right, so this is kind of, Contrary in, in a way that it seems it's not maybe obvious, but like, how is it you know bad to have early success? Well, in this case, the encoder and the validator became really popular, and they dominated a lot of the requests and questions in the mailing lists. In fact, parts those parts of ESAPB became so popular that like the encoder, for instance, was <coughs> excuse me was recognized as a mitigating defense uh, in some SaaS tools like. Uh, Fortify and Veracode, right? But that diverted the attention away from the things that, I mean, to me, like if we're going to put out a reference model, you can't just have like some that are really like enterprise ready and others that are just like toy implementations. And unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that really would have made um, ESAP be really, really usable is like the authenticator and the access controller, for instance. Um, only had toy implementations. And by toy implementations, I meant not that they didn't work, but that they didn't scale to enterprise levels because they were based on like flat files. And, you know, you're not going to add, uh, you know, a million users to a flat file. But if they would have done like something like LDAP or something, right, they could have scaled it. <clears throat> In fact, that still hasn't changed, right? So. <clears throat> Hold on, sorry. All right. Um, the other thing is that there's little consideration given that the library development differs from application development, right? One of the things that Agile basically emphasizes is the constant refactoring, right? And you can do that if, you're, if your end users happen to be humans. When your end users happen to be code, right? That's a little harder to do because humans have invested time in making that code, their application that's using the, your library. And if you start changing interfaces, you're going to break client code, right? So that is a big problem and you just cannot refactor the interfaces. You can sort of refactor, um, you know, some of the other public classes, um, but Part of the problem was that we found that there were people using like some of the classes, but not through the interfaces. And in fact, they were doing that in some places where ESAP was calling things like that and caused us problems. We had to rewrite things. Um, I think it's, it's you know bad because this was before uh, Java 8 and, and Java modules came out. So it was kind of difficult to restrict that. Um, but that was kind of an ugly thing that we just kind of relied on and crossed our fingers that, that, you know, people wouldn't do that too much. The other thing is like, how do you security test a security library, right? So unlike say something like a Rust API, one cannot simply do like general fuzzing of an SDK on interfaces because the strong typing in Java really makes that difficult, right? So if you want to basically say, well, there's, this is supposed to be a integer if i change it to a string what happens or if i change right i mean it just it just blows up right so i mean it's like that wouldn't even compile right so you you just can't really test that way um and and you can't test interfaces alone as i said because you know you have no executable code to test all right so jumping to the people perspective right how the people this is about how the people involved with ESAPI affected the process and the product itself. 
and then a succession of leadership in particular. And I cannot, again, present you with a complete perspective of this since I didn't join ESAP until, as Charles mentioned, in June 2009. And, um, and even for that first year, I was almost solely focused, you know, heads down on, on the cryptography aspects and, and trying to fix that. <clears throat> so the good, and I think I'm not going to be able to mention all the people, right? But we had great leadership and first Jeff Williams, then Jim Manico that ensured kept it running smoothly and kept everybody happy more or less. And, and we had a bunch of contributors. I mean, we probably had a dozen contributors when I started, um, you know, people like uh, Dave Wickers and Arshan and, and, Mike Boberski and uh, August and I don't I mean I can't remember everybody's name I'm sure I'm, and I'm not trying to slight anybody but just you know I should have brought a, a contributors list with me to put up here <clears throat> but so we, that was a good thing right um, we also had a lot of initial enthusiasm up through the 2.0 uh, general availability release uh, and we did like several it was a very long drawn out process for that 2.0 release uh, because we did, I think about six or seven release candidates. Um, but there were, and the other thing that was really a positive was that um, it wasn't like people were fighting, you know, on Twitter and arguing on Twitter in public and stuff. We did have a public merit uh, mailing list that was not moderated, but, the technical disagreements I felt were handled very professionally and transparently and civilly, right? So I think those were all very good things. So what was the bad? Well, I think one of the things is that the leaders who passed on succession to at least myself, I mean, both of these bullet points, these sub bullet points would apply to me. I'm not going to speak for Chris Schmidt. I think he did fine. Um, but I think that like Jim Manico, who passed on the torch to the two of us, um, didn't, <coughs> excuse me, take into consideration the good technical leaders in the business world do not necessarily translate to uh, the FOSS world because <clears throat> like in the business world, I can tell somebody to do this by a specific date, right? If they don't do it, then I can go speak to their manager, um, you know, if I don't get cooperation. Here in the FOSS world, right, everybody's doing this as a volunteer, and they ha also have family obligations and stuff like that. So it's just a completely different uh, mentality of motivating people. Um, the second thing is that um, if you you know, picking the successor by stepping down and, and putting the two most committed volunteer or committers, most involved committers as co leads is not necessarily a good strategy for success either, right? Which is, I think, what happened. I mean, Chris Schmidt and I, toward the end, were doing probably 75, 80% of the commits between us. And, um, and most of the people kind of like fell off at the end, and we, you know, carried through all the way to the bloody end of the release. And Chris helped Jim, I think, with the release. Um, but if you remember, if you're a dinosaur like me anyways, and you remember like some of the Looney Tune cartoons and stuff like that, uh, those uh, cartoons were like where there's like an army and a and bunch of soldiers lined up in a line. And like the captain says, all right, all volunteers for this dangerous mission, please step forward. And all but one clueless sap basically takes a collective you know, collective step backward and leaving that poor sucker sitting in the front saying, what just happened? You know, I felt that was me when Manico selected Chris Schmidt and I to be his successor. I'm like, what the heck? I didn't volunteer for this. It's like, you know, so, I mean, I, I felt like obligated to the project and I wanted to see it succeed. And I felt if nobody else, I mean, I was like, you can't, and he says, I don't think anybody else wants to do it. And I'm like, well, okay, I guess I'll, accept it but you know whatever so so the people perspective that's the bad so next the ugly and yep, there's me uh i've been told that i've had a face for radio or podcast maybe 
So seriously, um, after the 2.0 uh, GA release, pretty much all the other help disappeared, right? So Chris and I basically handled about 98% of the work and parent, you know, every once in a while, Jim Manico would pop back in and help us out on something. But the, uh, I think the biggest problem to me was that the previous regime did not like pass on any details of how to actually do a release. Today, I like to say that that is well documented. I mean, in a, like a 15 page document, right? And every little step that you have to take. But back then it was like magic and Chris had sort of figured out how to do it, but then he had to leave after a few years because he had other commitments because he had made some job changes that just, you know, pretty much consumed them. And so, um, you know, I was kind of here, left my lonesome trying to figure out how to do releases when they were like, you know, uh, vulnerable dependencies that I had patched in, in the development build, but not like, uh, you know, I had no way to get them to Maven Central and ask the mailing lists and stuff like that. And nobody really knew. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, trying to get over COVID here. So that's so why I kind of got a cough. Um, all right. So this is a discussion of the technical decisions around the architecture and the design and, and kind of what I learned, the lessons I learned there. So the good, well, like I said, it started with interfaces and it's always good to start with interfaces and, and just kind of like, you know, that's the way I design libraries as well, right? You know, you sketch out some things and then you start using them. You write like fake programs with them, trying to use those interfaces to see if they're kind of more or less, you know, correct and then change them and go back and forth, right? But essentially you got to write at least some kind of a scaffold or something because you can't actually execute it test like I mentioned right um and in fact jeff's jeff williams who started esapi in somewhere around 2007 um basically his after talking to him his his basic idea was actually to get the vendors to do the various reference implementations that were based on these implementations and it was these interfaces were supposed to be sort of common and span across, you know, multiple programming languages. And at one point in time, if you go back and look at ESAPI in 2009, we had an ESAPI, or at least either in progress or, you know, or 2010, let's say, um, we had like an ESAPI for C and ESAPI for C++. We had one for PHP. We had one for Cold Fusion. Um, we had one for Apex. Um, I think the Cold Fusion and, and uh, Apex one are still um, done by their respective vendors. Um, I don't know if they've kept them up to date and I don't think they've ever updated them like, you know, according to the 2.0 changes, but um, anyways, again, it's just like, it's really hard though that you can't really build an interface in a vacuum and because um, you need to know if they're correct, right? I think the other thing that was good is um, we realized that some implementations were needed, even if they were only rudimentary. So that was a good thing. They did build those reference models out that they can sort of test with and things like that. Uh, and the property driven approach to select a specific implementation, that was kind of the way that Jeff designed it to basically allow somebody to put their own implementation in. And that was his vision was basically somebody like in an enterprise or a vendor would like write a custom thing like for instance somebody maybe like mozilla who had like uh, an ldap interface back then right they might like have done uh, an authenticator that basically hooked into that esapi interface and just you know here's a library you could use whatever but that that, that really never um came to be all right so these, again, I want to emphasize are my own opinion, not in anybody else that necessarily was involved with ESAPI, but um, it, it is shared by the current uh, crew and uh, the current contributors, um, Matt Seil and, uh, geez, his name escapes me. Oh, I apologize. Uh, anyways, uh, 
so uh monolithic approach was bad right um singletons were a terrible idea some implementations were too successful too soon i kind of already touched on that um, many implementations uh, many individual interfaces uh comprised of a single security control became bloated and we had an uncontrolled growth of uh properties and i'm going to speak to all those other things in the next slide but i want to right now just kind of like say one thing about the singletons which has always been my biggest gripe because it probably affected me more than anybody else especially trying to test um I'll give you an example right if let's suppose you have an application that wanted to use esapi for encryption and you had some you, you're doing some new encryption you wanted to use aes but you had some old stuff that you had encrypted right and it was using triple does all right so basically in esapi you could not use the esapi encryptor the the java encryptor implementation right had it was a singleton and it basically was a property driven thing and the property you picked was this is the cipher that i want to use right there wasn't any way to pass in the cipher that you wanted to use and so what happened was like you either picked aes or you picked triple des and then you were stuck with it because it was a singleton right now we had a kludge in in the esapi class that basically allowed you to change the configuration temporarily and then you could switch it back to the old one but it was not thread safe right well that's not a problem right well yeah because every you know web application is which is what esapi was intended for um is multi-threaded so yeah it was a problem all right so i'll talk about the other issues now um all right, so ESAPI, like the monolithic approach, right? Why is that a problem? Well, ESAPI has 12 direct compile time dependencies, all right? That pulls in 14 additional transitive compile time dependencies, right? So why is that a problem? Well, if you wanted to use something like the ESAPI encryptor, right, um, which requires no external dependencies itself, if you're comfortable with using Sun JCE and the Java util logging for logging, right? It still has to pull in 20, all 26 of those dependencies, um, even though technically it would not need any, right? So that's a problem. Um, people didn't like that. Like, why do I have to do, you know, pull in all these things, even though, right? So it's like, if we just split it up, it wouldn't have been that way. Um, <clears throat> This has caused also problems with vulnerable dependencies that are past uh, end of life, right? So like this second point, um, right, means that I've had like, every time there is a new vulnerability in uh, log4j 1.x, right, which is end of life, um, I have to research it and write up a security notice. And that has been a pretty frequent thing because we cannot completely eliminate it, that log4j dependency despite having the fact that we could support log4j you know one through an slf for j bridge right because if we did that it would break backwards compatibility of people's code they would have to in other words rewrite some code right so that's why we haven't just like removed it but in my opinion that was an indication that there was something done wrong right because we have to be able to design code so that we can at least remove unsupported libraries right um without the crew tax that we require right now right like right now if you want to use esapi uh what i recommend to people is you say if you know use slf for j uh and log back or something like that and then put in exclude log for j you know whatever the version was right um and then it just won't get sucked into your thing but the problem is that like when they do things like uh dependency check or something like that it'll still pick it up and flag it so um anyway so yeah that's the monolithic approach right so that's why i want to get rid of it um bloated dependencies so all right uh so the encoder has 22 methods right um about half roughly half of those are encoders and roughly half of those are decoders the encoders are used 
very, very frequently. In fact, the encoder interface and the encoders like encode for HTML, encode for JavaScript, you know, encode for CSS, all those things. Those are the heavily used. I mean, probably 80% of the use of eSAPI is through the encoder interfaces for those various encode for whatever methods about which there's, you know, a very small set of them. Um, we could have, and we probably should have separated out the decoder methods because the decoder methods are rarely, if ever used. I don't think I've, like I did a lot of code reviews when I was at Wells Fargo that used eSAPI. I don't recall ever seeing anybody using the decoder stuff. Um, but 22 methods isn't so bad when you compare that to the HTTP utilities interface, which was kind of like a potpourri of anything and everything that had anything to do with HTTP. It had 60 methods, right? And many of them were very nuanced because they had like version, you know, one or like two arguments, three arguments, four arguments, five arguments, six arguments, something like that, all the same method. And part of that was, you know, obviously, um, because just uh, Java's stupidity of not being able to support default arguments, which I thought was at least one of the great features of, of C++ that really, you know, smashes down the size of things. And, and implementation-wise, it wasn't a problem, right? You just basically would call some other implementation, you know, something with a default argument. So the implementation was simple, but it bloated those those interfaces and the methods and, and made, it, made it very complicated to read the Java doc and stuff like that. Um, so the uncontrolled property growth. So adding a new property required this in the, in the implementation class for security uh, configuration interface which was called default security configuration, right? You would have to add uh, a public final string to represent the property. Optionally, you would put in a public final, a public static final string to represent the default value of the property. Um, so in other words, if they didn't put it in their ESAPI properties file and somebody called it from their code, it would still have a default. Um, and then um, you would have to put in a public method to access the particular property. So I have an example here with HTTP, the force HTTP only cookies, right? <clears throat> well, you know, this alone might not have been a problem, except for we started, everybody started saying, hey, I like this properties thing. Everything's property driven, it's easy to change it. You know, we allow people to customize it, uh, the develop, you know, the end users and clients. Um, they could set them to whatever they want and stuff like that's really flexible, right? But this interface started to get bloated as well. And I didn't count up the, the size of the interface for the security configuration interface because right now most of the stuff we've deprecated and we suggest that like, you know, we have like a get string prop, get int prop, get bool prop, you know, that type of thing where you just pass in the property name um, but, uh, so that's sort of fixed, right? But it's like, it, it just really makes it ugly and, and made it hard to maintain. And, and this, that was just the wrong way to do it. Um, so, but yeah, these, these other, these things like this example that you're seeing right here, this, this is actually deprecated now. So in the, in the interface. All right, um, so the other thing's ugly. Uh, we had this radical inner inter dependency on ESAPI properties and logging and exceptions that was made apparent because we had this very tightly coupled, very tight coupling between security configuration interface, the logger interface and enterprise security exception and sort of by extension uh, transitively uh, the user because the enterprise security exception did logging, right? And there was also actually, depending on which exception you used, uh, the intrusion uh, detection stuff would come into play too. Um, so that was kind of a problem. 
Um, if you ever are interested in like looking at what I'm talking about more specifically, uh, just pull down the the uh, ESAPI code sometime and run like Maven site, the MVM site command, and then look at the J depends output, and you'll see what I mean. Um, Second thing, um, there's too many ill-timed changes that were done at the same time. I mean, handling one change at a time is fine. Multiple changes at a time, bad news, right? So we were forced because Google code was sort of going away and it was using subversion and we looked for an alternative and ended up with, hey, well, everybody's using Git and GitHub. So let's make the switch. So, okay, that wasn't, a problem to most of the people because almost everybody, um, you know, were using IDEs. But certain dinosaurs, me being one of them, um, are more fond of the command line, right? And I do almost all of my development from the command line, and I only break out an IDE basically when I need to either examine somebody else's code or when I need to break out a debugger. And that's pretty much the only time. Um, everything else is just, they just use v GVIM or something like that. So that was a problem because, you know, I had to learn to get command line and what all the things do instead of just clicking on different, oh, I want to commit this or whatever. Um, and then the other thing was changing from Ant to Maven. We did that at the same time that we moved from Google Code to, to Git. And probably, you know, it was the right move. I mean, Ant was getting old and stuff like that, but Ant works on basically explicit instructions of telling, you know, you tell it exactly what you want it to do. In Maven, you pick a plugin and the plugin figures out what you want to do. And so the first, you know, the first uh, thing, first task is figure out which plugin that you should be using, right? And then the second task is, Make sure you got the plugin configured right with the right parameters. And then the third thing is you got to figure out like what the Maven goal is and, and wire everything else up so that it comes out like if when you do a, a test or a deploy or whatever that it calls the right plugins and stuff. So that was, you know, kind of a big pain in the butt. Um, the, uh, anyways, you know, uh, and I, and I, had all kinds of questions about Maven in terms of like how to how to do deployments and stuff with it, and it just uh, you know it just um, was very frustrating for me. Um, we uh, also trusted the NSA for a code review, right? I knew my limitations. Um, you know, Bruce Schneier has said that basically anybody can write cryptography code that they think is secure. Um, there's a story about Ron Rivest actually that basically he spent like uh, you all heard of uh, RC four no wait, RC RC two was RC three I think it was um, that basically <coughs> that basically he designed after RC two that never became widespread because he went to some crypto conference and somebody. He gave a talk on it, and by the end of the conference, supposedly somebody had cracked it, right, after all those years. So it's like, you know, I am no Ron Rivest, obviously. Um, so I felt uncomfortable of just, like, nobody else that was working on ESAPI, um, you know, new cryptography. I made a call out to the leaders list and or some of the general ESAPI lists and nobody responded. I got one response um, that I put it out on some public mailing lists and, and one person said, yeah, I'll review it for you for $30,000. Well, we only had like, it was probably only like less than 1200 lines of code. I didn't think that was a very good uh, deal. So Dave Wickers um, basically knew somebody at NSA and they said, yeah, they have this thing that like sometimes reviews open source code and they would do it for us. So they didn't they decided not to just do a code review on the crypto, but on the whole thing. Right. And I interacted with them and they found like, oh, you should use, uh, I don't know, SHA-256 here instead of SHA-128 or whatever. <clears throat> instead of SHA-1. Um, but, you know, 
to our credit, uh, we, we, this was pre Snowden days, but you know, uh, that CVE that, that was discovered that I mentioned earlier, uh, CVE dash 200, uh, dash 2013 dash 5679 was there because of a 1.4 backward compatibility interface. And that should have been spotted by any buddy in NSA that was clueful of cryptography. Basically, it found a way to bypass the integrity checks with the with the HMAC um, and bypass that. Um, and I just am like really upset that they didn't find that. I mean, I suppose it's plausible deniability, but you know, uh, after hearing the story about the NSA backdooring the the dual EC uh, DRBG, the the elliptic curve deterministic random bit generator uh, that then they had NIST advertise as the greatest thing since sliced bread. It became obvious that our trust was uh, misplaced in NSA. So, and we also had a bunch of open issues that presumably were important um, that are never addressed. And then we have rules for locating ESAP properties that are just, I think, way too complicated. So like regarding the issues that were never addressed, right? If you add these up, we have like 112 potentially important issues that have been ignored or forgotten or whatever, right? Um, swept under the rug, I don't know. But as far as I know, none of them have ever been like turned into GitHub issues and worked on. And, um, you know, presumably they were at least important to the author at one point in time. Right. So I, I I have no idea. I mean, I've not even looked at, there's so many of them that I've not even looked through all of them. Now, truth in advertising, all the ones that are listed as open issue and discuss were ones that I added as flags or basically with the expectation that we were going to do code review and I was going to get feedback on these things, but like the NSA never even, you know, asked about them. I, I asked about a few of them that were there. There was used to be like more open issues and discuss things. And, and I deleted a couple cause I got to talk to some of the NSA people, but um, you know, if we're not doing these things, it feels like nobody's really watching what's going on. Right. At least to me. Um, so the other thing is, um, Finding the ESAPI properties, or you know, how, how do you locate that ESAPI properties file? Okay, so I want to say right now, the single most frequently asked question on Stack Overflow about ESAPI is help, my implementation can't find the ESAPI properties, right? And it's just, it's because it's really complicated, right? It's documented in not in the interface, right? Because hey, the interface shouldn't tell you how to find it, right? It's the it's the implementation that decides that. But people don't normally go and look in the default security configuration, which is the implementation. <coughs> and one of the few things that you really can't can't change the implementation of unless you want to rewrite some significant parts of ESAPI, right? But um, the rules, just so you know, roughly are. You first look inside of a directory that's set with a call, a security config. Well, not security config. Well, yeah, uh, it's actually there's a esapi dot something. I think it's esapi dot uh, security configuration dot set resource directory uh, full uh, path name or something like that. Um, so you can do that, or you can, and you'd have to like do that in a like a startup class of some kind before you use esapi ever. Uh, or you can set it with a system dot get property. You can set the property org dot owasp dot esapi dot resources to some directory that it'll look in. Or you can set um, it'll look also if that's not if it doesn't find it from those first two steps, it'll look under the system property user dot home under uh, the slash esapi directory. Or then for background compatibility, the slash dot esapi directory. And if it doesn't find those, then it'll look under the first ESAPI directory for the class path on the class path for several different class path loaders, which I've basically excluded here just to avoid clutter, 
right? But there's like, I think three or four different class path loaders that it looks through. Uh, and if it doesn't find it there, then it goes back and tries again with dot ESAPI, which I'm not sure anybody, why would anybody would put that in a jar or a war or whatever, but <laughs> I mean a dot directory, but um, I suppose they could. Um, anyways, so, you know, if that doesn't, you know, find if it does get found, it, it stops looking and it logs it to standard output. But a lot of people have disabled that standard output logging because it's just noisy, especially when you run tests. Um, so, in conclusion, right, um, I think monolithic libraries are a thing of the past. Back when we started this, when this was started and originally designed in 2007, we didn't have things. Well, I mean, there may have been things like there certainly was micro architectures and micro kernels and things like that, but they weren't as popular as they are today. We didn't have all the microservices and things like that. Um, I, I think that um, the big problem with monolithic libraries is this flat out makes things too brittle. It makes things too hard to change. Um, and in ESAP E3, which we have um, lovingly started calling 3SAP, uh, um, it's going to be done very differently. And that's kind of another talk. But um, and shout out to, uh, oh, yeah, that's his name, Jeremiah Stacy, who's um, the other major contributor, contributor to, besides Matt Sile. So shout out to Jeremiah for. For that clever name unfortunately we won't actually be able to use it uh as a in a formal name because you can't start like a package name with like can't do org dot you know owasp dot three sap because you can't start with a three and we don't really want to spell it out so anyways so that's it anybody questions are we about at the question time charles